So I think I made, I guess like a lifestyle decision about 18 months ago where I was kind of like near the front of the age group races and I kind of thought that not easily, but like with a little extra effort and a little bit more commitment towards it, you know, turning professional was kind of a real goal. Oh, that's great. Yeah, the amount of contracts, they just fly in. 100 grand here, 100 grand then. <laughs> no, um, to be honest, not much has changed. And when I raced Outlaw Half last year and kind of lined up against the professionals there and actually kind of saw where I kind of stacked up straight away, it was kind of like a no-brainer. The decision to turn pro was like pretty easy for me because like as an athlete I'm always wanting to see how far I can get and also challenge myself against the best. So far I, ha I don't think I've had a fair, not a fair, I haven't had the proper like opportunity to kind of display the gains I've made over the last 12 months as well. So I did a couple of pro races end of last year. It was, it's almost funny because I had a, a five minute penalty in the first one. In the second one, I got changed to a duathlon. And then in the last one, I flew out to California, it got canceled. How, if someone asks you how your first three pro races went, you could pretty much say pretty shocking. <laughs> so the penalty was, yeah, drafting. So a French athlete slopped, uh, slotted in in front of me and the official decided to come around the corner at the same time. So I was in the draft zone. <laughs> so I don't think I've had an opportunity to actually race, but from what I have done in terms of within that first race in that 70.3, the duathlon I've done, I kind of know that my biking ability is kind of on par with, I'd say like the stronger riders in like long distance try. I wouldn't say it's like the Uber bikers, like your, your Ditlevs, your Sam Longs, your what? Your Joe Skippers, they're kind of maybe on that next level already. But I'd say like for, for the most part, I think I could probably fair race, ride with a lot of like pro athletes already. That paired with like an elite swim background, you kind of, I feel like two thirds of the race, I'm already quite competitive. The biggest thing over the next sort of 12 to 24 months is just keeping to keep on developing my run. Because in terms of like racing, I will be racing for, you know, two thirds of the race. But the difference between actually like finishing on a podium or, you know, finishing 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th or, you know, in some stack fields even top 20 would be being able to run a couple of minutes quicker over 70.3 or, you know, 5, 10 minutes quicker over an Ironman. I think that's going to be the biggest change for me. But I know that I'm like in a really fortunate position having 15 years of like swimming in the bank. Those amateurs that want to turn professional but don't have any sort of experience of swimming before starting the sport. I think that's probably the biggest shock is there are good swimmers and bad swimmers in pro triathlon and pro long distance triathlon, but the margins are not massive, whereas in the amateur field they are, and you've got the time to sort of make it up. But in pro field, it's kind of like, if you get left behind, the race might just disappear from you. A 26, 27 minute, you know, 1.9K is pretty, handy for an age grouper, but in the pro field, you're three minutes off the back. Yeah, being able to already swim those 22, 23, 24 minutes, depending on the course, unless something shocking happens in the swim, I should always be in that front group. That's quite a nice position to be in, being like a new pro. Moving into being a professional, I think the aspiration is to be, you know, like a full-time professional and actually being able to say I'm a professional in, in the sense that sport, racing, sponsorship, all that sort of stuff is my, my job. At the moment, I've kind of got my time sort of split a little bit with having part-time jobs to be able to finance, you know, living, house, mortgage, all that sort of stuff, but as well as, you know, racing. Half and half in terms of like, I think it's pretty traditional for a new pro to, you know, you need a, a secondary income, but it means that like, you've got to train, hopefully to the level that some of those top guys are training without having the full time to recover and all that sort of stuff. So it, it does make it harder, um, but I think it's pretty achievable. Finding sponsorship, I think like I've had a couple of companies who kind of bought into me pre-turning professional, saw that I was like at the front, at front level of the age race already. I was quite vocal about the fact that, you know, I want to race professional. I, I think I could be quite good in the sport. Some of them have developed partnerships over the last sort of 12 months um, as I turn professional. So hopefully as I evolve as an athlete, some of those companies will evolve with me, but also other companies might see the 
market value in me, the advantage I could be for them. I think I have quite like a dynamic portfolio in the sense that, you know, I, I think I can be at the front of the race. Maybe if you're like a really, really like top class runner, but you're slightly weaker in the first two disciplines, you might still, you know, be there or thereabouts, but you're always coming from the back of the field and you don't quite have that sort of like, I guess TV pre presence in the sense that they always do tend to focus on the first handful of athletes every time. I'd say I've stepped up, but I've stepped up like quite, I guess in like a sensible incremental way. I haven't thought like I was an elite, elite age grouper, if you want to call it that. And I was training maybe like 18 to 22, 23 hours and getting good results off that. So I'm not naive in the fact that you can't just suddenly like start training 35 hours a week and you're going to get massive gains from that. But what I have probably done is had a small improvement in terms of like my average is now probably in the low 20, 22, 23. I do some bigger weeks where they are 25, 26, 27, but I don't do that every week. I, I don't even think it's anything necessary in the last 12 months I've done. I think it's just the fact that like running, for example, I only started like running in 2018. So I'm like another year into running and just like, naturally your paces start getting a little bit quicker, your heart rate's a little bit lower, you're doing slightly more volume each week, even if it's just like an extra five or six K average that you didn't do last year, you're banking a lot more miles over the last, like 12 months. For me, it's kind of just keep on adding and layering on what I'm doing, finding things that work for me. Eventually, you know, there's gonna be that kind of point of intersection where there is only about like so much time in the week and if you're part-time working and you're, and you're trying to train to like a certain level, hopefully at that point, they kind of meet quite nicely and I'm able to, you know, drop a lot of work, increase the training. But at the moment it's kind of, I'm trying to find a nice, a nice balance between enough for me to continue to develop and not trying to rush anything. So I guess in like the last month, I had a couple of bigger weeks at the beginning of that where I was doing maybe 25, 26 hours, and those kind of looked like, I think it was about six and a half hours of swimming. I trained five days a week. I was doing a couple of longer swims, and then three swims, which were like 60 minutes to 70 minutes. And what I do with my swims is, because I've got the background in swimming, I tend to do a lot of just like steady aerobic, a lot of technique work, but I try and do one key session a week, quite fast paced work or more like threshold based, but just try and make sure I, I've got that one intense swim a week. With my running, it's kind of the same sort of template I have. Just, I try and get in sort of 60 to 70 kilometers, which I have been doing. There's sort of two key sessions there. One key session I have is my long run at the weekend, which will have a lot of like marathon pace work. And um, during the week, I'll have a, again, an intense run, which would vary from sub threshold to threshold to even more like zone four, zone five work just to get run economy. Four and a half to five hours, not big time. Basically what I can manage at the moment and hopefully that will grow. I guess the rest of it, that sort of like 10 to 15 hours is more like the bike volume. And that's kind of broken up as like a bigger ride, some shorter aerobic rides, which are like a couple of hours, a couple of two and a half hours. And again, I try and do a key ride, which Started off a bit more intense, sort of five, four, five, six weeks ago, but more recently has turned into 70.3 efforts. And then I've done a little bit of threshold this week. I had this conversation with a lot of people. It's just, there's no kind of secret answer to training. I've done a really consistent winter. I've had a, I have had a knee niggle, has caused a little bit of an issue in terms of like overall volume, like three months ago, but I've just been layering it on and I think that's what you gotta kinda of do long term. It's keep banking the easy work, you know, your easy run that you just think, oh, I can't really be like asked to get out today, but actually I've just gotta get 45 minute e easy run done just to keep the volume taken over. I think they're the ones that actually come race day matter more than those like one session where you're like running super fast and you're like, oh, I feel amazing. You'd probably be able to do that anyway race day without necessarily having done that session. So yeah, I think it's just banking, banking those sessions and just, uh, yeah, keep it progressing.